Welcome again to our dynamic talk by Grid Dynamics. My name is Elvina and I will moderate this talk today. You will listen to three technical talks by our QA experts from Grid Dynamics. Uh, I am going to introduce our speakers today, but a little bit later. Firstly, I want to share some information about our company, uh, why we want to share our expertise. And for this, I will invite my colleague, Marika. Can you share it with us? <laughs> yes, of course. Hello, everyone. I hope you hear me clear. And my name is Marika, and I will tell you a little bit about our company. So the Grid Dynamics is a leading provider of technology consulting, engineering, and data science services, Fortune 500, corporation from financial, technological, and retail sector. Our company has been operating since 2006 and is headquartered in California and has development centers in United States, Eastern and Central Europe. So as of today, uh, Grid Dynamics brings together more than 3,500 engineers in 14 different countries. As you can see, uh, we have a large amount of different offices in different countries and we continue to grow up steadily. So Grid Dynamics is a NASDAQ listed public technological service company with core expertise in big data, data science, machine learning and IE, scalable omnichannel services, DevOps and cloud enablement. So also you can find more information on, on our site, griddynamics.com. And to understand who we are working with, you can see the list of our partner and clients in different spheres like tech, finance, retail, and other. So more information you can find also on our career side. And if you want, until we're waiting for people to join, you can go by this QR code uh, to our site and search for some career opportunities you want or read more about our company. So thank you for joining. Yes, I will return to this slide to show our topics today. So we will speak about introduction to playwright, do's and don'ts for technical interviews from both sides, interviewer and a candidate, and the specialization leads in grid dynamics. Who are these heroes? And the first, our speaker, the Gennady Chursov, QA engineer uh, in our company, with a speech about the do's and don'ts for technical interviews. So, Gennady, if you are ready, you can start. Yeah, hello everyone. So, let me share my presentation. So, hello, let me introduce myself. So, I'm Gennady Chursev. I'm Senior Automation Quality Engineer in Grid Dynamics. I'm working more than three years in the company. With overall than more than 10 years in IT, working as QE lead and mentor. And the first, I wanted to discuss why I actually start this topic, why interviews, why I pick up that. So previously, in three last companies, I participated in interviewing. And since May this year, I participated in more than 40 interviews. So it's averaged more than 10 interviews per month. So I know how to interview. I passed interviews in other companies and did it several companies in a row. So what we will cover today? So we will start with stages of interview process from interviewer side with do's and don'ts. And then we will do the same for a candidate side. And at the end, we will check general list of advice for successful interview. So let's start with some stages of overall interview process. So UN, it contains several big topics. It's preparation, main, and finish. As you see, it contains 12 steps. Now let's check each stage in details and starting with preparation step for interviewer. So preparation step starting with preparing general questions and coding tasks in advance. Then it's good to sync up with the second interviewer if needed. You need to also analyze candidate CV and prepare your workspace for the interview. So when we speak about preparing general question, usually I'm doing that. So if I'm participating in an interview for quality assurance automation, I need to prepare some specific topic for each area. For example, it could be create theory, UI automation, backend, tools, and etc. Also, I divide all questions by grade, like junior, middle, senior, lead engineer. I also add a list of soft skill questions to my preparation set. Then I'm preparing coding tasks. So usually, I prepare several tasks, also divided by difficulty. It could be warm-up task, simple, or even difficult. 
I also try to register to some online coding tool, like for example, code interview. So our candidates do not need to share the screen. We can do it in some online coding tool. And I also need to prepare, so I need to know how to solve every task that I prepared. Maybe some good solution, uh, alternative solution, et cetera. Then it's not mandatory, it's more about optional, but you need to prepare a story about the company. It depends on the situation. For example, in some uh, processes, you don't need to answer a question about the company because it did previously on HR or recruitment interview stuff. But it's good to know about information about company, mission, value, benefits of working in the company, and maybe even your story while you're working here. So in total, you will have preparation steps for coding and answer part for both areas, starting from junior to lead engineer. Next stage is to sync up with your second interviewer. So it's good to have second opinion. Even if you are experienced engineer, second opinion, it's good to have. And you need to sync up this second interviewer in terms of who will ask what, what coding part you were going to do, and et cetera. So now let's check what if you will skip that part, if you will skip preparation and sync up. So usually it means like you not prepared well. So it could be synchronization issue with second interviewer. For example, you I don't know, want to ask something that your second interviewer also want to ask. And for example, he doesn't have any other questions. So it could be some issue. And uh, another thing is that you probably need to prepare because you need to check CV, other stuff, and you need to compare it with general questions that you can answer. Next page is next stage is actually analyzing CV candidate. And usually it's several steps. So first, you need to check that candidate CV meet specific position on your vacancy. Then you can prepare questions about responsibilities, achievement tools, and other things that you I don't know, want to ask about candidate. And also it will be good if you check that candidate don't have mistakes in CV, or for example, didn't add some uh, information that are actually not true. So if you skip that thing, first thing, you probably will ask something like more general questions, not specific to his own experience. So every candidate differs from another candidate. So it's good to focus on the stuff that he actually worked on based on his previous experience. And also, if you will not check his resume cover letter, et cetera, maybe you can even not uh, remember his name and it will be some not good situation. So next stage is preparing your workspace for interviews. So you see eight icons. I will explain what icon means. First, it's more about you need to turn your camera on. Second, you need to check that your microphone is working correctly. Next, it's good to book a room in advance. Or if you're doing it from home, just ask your uh, someone is you living for, just to not disturb you for some time. Also, it will be great if you will try some uh, test call. For example, if you are using Zoom or WebEx or any other instrument for remote interview. So it's good to have that it's working on your PC, computer, and etc. Next is good to have a list of paper, a pen, maybe a glass of water. You also need to turn off your notification on mobile phone, maybe a disable notification on your laptop. Next is more about casual style or even formal style that depends on your situation. It also could include some I don't know, background checks. So there is no disruption, there is no mess in the background of your video. And the last but not the least point, you need to be in a good mood be polite and enjoy the interview. So if you will accept all the topics that I discussed for workspace, it should look like something like that. But if you will ignore everything, it should be something like that. So you see the difference? So what could go wrong? So first thing, you can barely hear your candidate or interviewer. It actually will be negative feedback about that. So 
let's try to do something to be prepared well. And one tip for, from me, for example, if you wanted to book a room, do it in advance because once I tried to book a room and every room was already not available. So do it at least one day before. Next, let's move on to main interview steps that contains introduction part, warming up, main part that contains both technical and soft skill question, and coding part. Let's start with introduction. So introduction usually means that it contains small talk, you introduce yourself, your position, other stuff. You also need to define stages of interview. For example, for me, it's something like, hello, my name is Gennady Chirsev. Our interview usually contains several parts. First, it is introduction, then it will be technical assessment, and at the end, you will have uh, time to ask your question. And then you can tell about the company and position if needed, but we already discussed that it's optional, it depends on how you provide interview. For example, if it's technical interview, usually recruitment team already described position and told about company. And also sometimes it's good not to tell about the company and wait until the candidate will ask about it. Also, you can ask candidates to start a story about themselves. So this is over for preparation step. And what if you will skip something like, yeah, it could be negative way. So you not break so the ice with your conversation. If you will ignore small talk, you also need to keep in mind that there is some main topic for small talk, like about religion and another stuff. Also, it's good that you introduce the success stages and etc. So maybe, for example, your candidate hurry and he cannot attend on your interview more than one hour. So you need set stages and pain lines at the beginning. So let's go to main part, warm up, technical and soft skills. Usually I'm starting this simple question and task just to warm up our candidate. Then I'm increasing or even decreasing the difficulty of questions depending on the candidate answers. For example, we wanted to hire a middle engineer. And we see that he has uh, limited experience, so we can a little bit decrease the difficulty. And for example, try to find the junior engineer instead. It also could be a good way. And for example, if our middle engineer answers on all questions, we can a little bit increase the difficulty. Maybe he even can be passed for a senior position. Then it's good to have both technical and soft skill or even meta skills. So you can check communications, timelines, and etc. all the basic stuff. And what about warm-up tones? So the first thing we need to follow our time limit. For example, for interview with a one hour and a half, usually it means something like small talk, one, two minutes, then introduction, no more 15, technical and soft skill, 25 or a half an hour, Practical task is the biggest part. It could be 35, 40 minutes. Candidate questions, five to 10 minutes. And farewell, just one minute. Okay, now we're talking about technical and soft skill don'ts. And for that, we need to stick to our main goal. And our main goal is actually to hire a candidate or if he not appropriate for position, I don't know, leave a positive feedback about the company, and about engineers that working in the company. So you need to follow the goal. You don't need to ask questions that actually not helping with you. For example, if you know something that candidate don't know and you already know about it, maybe you need just skip that difficult question because it will just you know, spoil the result. Okay, now we're moving to a coding part. So coding part, usually it contains setting up environment then at the beginning of coding part, it's good to set up the rules, explain the task, and also ask candidate to think loudly. It will be great if your candidate will explain the solution, not only just... Nie, spotkanie takie z tego qa -a. Okay. <laughs> Next, you need to set criteria for the task. For example, it could be time, memory, it could be specific algorithm. You can also add hints if needed during the interview part. For example, if your candidate stuck with the question, you can give a hint. If he completely stuck with the question, 
So you can even prepare another task and replace, or you can I don't know, increase or reduce difficulty, as we already mentioned. For coding part don'ts, actually, it follows from do's. For example, if you will not explain rules and et cetera, your candidate will start with maybe simple solution, but you need to stick to the time. So it will be not enough time for your candidate to try more difficult solution. So if you need specific knowledge from your candidate, you can mention it. And also, for example, maybe it's not a online coding part. Maybe you're doing it as a homework. So you also need to prepare rules, explain tasks, give some examples, repository, and et cetera. Time, memory, algorithm. So, and also you need to be prepared that your candidate actually will return you with a coding part. So you need to have enough time to check his task and give a feedback, constructive feedback with some details. Okay. Now let's move on to final interview steps that contain several stages. It's let the candidate ask questions, discussing what should be next, giving a feedback and farewell words, and writing detailed feedback. Let's start with asking candidates about questions. And you know, it's really important part of the interview because if your candidate don't ask any questions, it could mean that he's not too interested in your position. If he's asking questions, you can check his motivation and his priorities. So let's check what should be next to do. So usually it means like you need to define what next. For example, how long it will take your company to return back with the feedback or an offer if you are actually hiring this man. It's also matters because, for example, your candidate could have interviews in several companies at the same time. And at final, he needs to choose the company that he will be hiring. So if you will give him enough details, timelines, he probably can manage, I don't know, for example, how long he can wait until he will return this result about your company. And also on what's next, it's good to summarize all your interview. I don't know, give a thanks to your candidate. Maybe you could also mention that it will be additional interview. For example, if your interview consists of several stages, for example, it will be separate uh, technical interview, then interview with the team or manager assessment, whatever else. And you also can mention about detailed feedback on that part, but it's also not mandatory, it's optional. It depends with your company. So if your company allowing you to give a feedback just immediately after the interview, you can do that. What if you will not tell candidate an opinion and not ask about opinions, questions, and etc.? Probably you will miss actually good information about the candidate. For example, depending on candidate questions, you can, for example, find what interesting for that position that could be uh, useful for assignment of that candidate. For example, you have several projects, your candidate asked about several positions, so probably next it will be better to find him appropriate way to work in the company. About feedback and farewell. So asking feedback is a good way, but it also depends on the result. For example, if it's good, it's okay just to tell that everything correct, but you also need to mention that it's just a technical interview and you're not the person who given the final answer. So for example, I'm telling that I will give detailed feedback and then recruitment team will uh, send it. So I'm not the person who deciding hire you or not hiring you. So you need to wait final decision. So it's also depending on your company about giving details feedback or not but at all at the finish it's just good to say a thank you and wish a good day if you will not do that it's actually okay about feedback because initially you will do that with the offer with detailed feedback but saying okay about summarizing interviews saying thank you it's a good way because it will leave a positive feedback about the company and engineers that are working in the company so the last step, but not the least, writing detailed feedback, 
It actually is the main goal of interviewer because no one will know what actually you're thinking about the candidate if it might not be added to some list of interviewers' feedbacks. So as you see, it usually contains some content about like name candidate, position, stage of interview, your recommendation about hiring or not hiring, and etc. So usually I'm adding information about specific topics. For example, if I assess the candidate about topic of quality assurance, programming language, algorithm, tools, and etc., it could be completely different opinions. For example, as quality assurance engineer, he's pretty competent, but Java programming language is a bit less than average. But tools are great. So in average, I think that we can hire him as a middle engineer. So something like that. You also can add any other information that can help in make hiring decision or maybe even help with onboarding goals for a probation period. So what should be done for writing detailed feedback? You know, like sometimes uh, technical interviewer can just ignore some field or just put novice, competent, or expert without any detailed text. So for example, we are interview two candidates and they have the same uh, no, range, like both have novice or quality assurance, uh, no competent for programming language, how to compare to candidate if there is no text. So it will be good if you will uh, no, explain your decision, why it's novice, why it's competent, what you ask and what was uh, returned back from a candidate. And now we are going to uh, discuss preparation step for a candidate. But if you're a candidate for some technical position, everything that I described for interviewer, it also will be good for you. Now let's start. So for preparation step for a candidate, it contains four main steps. You need to check information about vacancy and the company. You need to prepare your story about your experience and your main achievements. You need to prepare for technical and soft skills and coding tasks. And you need to prepare a list of questions that you will ask on the final stage of the interview. Let's start about checking information about company. So almost every company contains in the internet some information. It could be official website. It could be some information in specific uh, aggregator of feedback, for example, Glassdoor or LinkedIn or etc. You can check information about vacancy. And you can even contact with any employers that actually working in that company. And it also could be used, for example, to not apply for a position in general way. You can ask any employers just to give a recommendation. It will be even better than just send a cover letter or your email. Uh, next is preparing a story about your experience and achievements. So my advice, your story should be prepared in advance. It should be at least 10 minutes, but if it will be more, it will be great. But sometimes it could be like several minutes. So you need to start your story with the most important information. So if you will be, I don't know, stopped at some point, you already describe everything that's vital for your experience and achievements. And also, when you speak about your experience, it's good to use STAR methodology. It contains situation, task, action, result for speaking about your experience and achievements. Next stage is preparing for technical questions and coding tasks. So, for example, uh, you wanted to pass an interview for automation quality assurance engineer. You can just type it in the Google and you find the tons of questions and answers for your position. You can also use tools for coding task training, like for example, lead code, code wires, something else. You can even use any mock interviews tools like Prom or interviewing IO, or you can just simply ask your friends or coworkers to help you with that. And you also need to prepare for soft skill questions like, <laughs> what are you going to do in five years? What do you go plan and etc. And the last point, you need to prepare questions for interview part. 
So already described it in the interview part. Now let's examine what exactly could be good, what exactly could be bad, and start with general questions. So what's next about the company, project, team, business, tips, etc. It's just general questions. It's just, you know, it's important information for someone of you. But if you will ask good questions, like about possibility to grow, about helping company, company and share knowledge, it could indicate that you're interested in a position, or maybe even that you can already uh, know, start doing something great at the starting of your career in the company. And it also could be a bad questions, for example, salary, benefits, promotion, maybe even asking about feedback that could indicate that you're not confident enough. So it's bad because it's technical interview. It's too early to ask about that stuff. Probably it's good time for asking about salaries, benefit, and other stuff after the technical interview when you will receive an offer and etc. So that's all from my side. If you have any questions, I will answer it. Let me check our chat. Yes, we have some questions in chat, so you can answer them. Okay, could you someone help me and I can read them. What exactly in candidate's answer makes you think he will fit for position? Okay, so candidate answers. It's actually a long term. So you need to check that position meets your requirements for a lot of topics. Like there is a checklist. You're checking technical experience, soft skills, meta skills, I don't know, ability to grow in the company. So if everything passing, it's not your way like you're telling that it will be a great. You're just, uh, I don't know, using some tooling or giving a feedback about the candidate. Then it will be the next stage and comparing which candidate is better, but it's not the goal of technical interview. Well, technical interview, just simple checking. If your candidate is good enough for technical, soft skills, and has ability to work in a team. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, uh, what do you prefer, live coding tasks or homework? Um, <laughs> actually, I'm not preferring not either two or se second variant. I think it also should be done without any interview part, but we are thinking in real world, it's hard to achieve. So it's better to have a small task during the interview because you focus to pass it. Homework usually rejected for experienced engineers. So it's good only for junior or even intern. So you need to check like basic skills for a candidate. So it depends. It depends from the company, how many candidates you have. You have, a, I don't know, thousands of engineers who want to want in your company or not. It actually depends on position and et cetera. Okay, and the next is, uh, what question do you ask on every interview? What is your favorite one? I don't know, I'm asking a lot of questions. It depends on grade of candidate. For example, if it's junior engineer, I'm starting about what's your biggest achievement on your latest project. It actually can highlight, I don't know, what he thinks the most important of position of quality assurance engineer. And actually, if he has a really good achievement, it's already a good starting point of asking additional questions. Okay, at, and the, what is the optimal um, technical interview time and why? Yeah, I think I already described it in some topic. Let me share it yeah, once more time. Yeah, I care about it. Yep. Yeah, for technical part, it's like 25, 30 minutes, practical task, a little bit more. It depends, for example, if you see that your candidate are not confident enough, you can skip and move on and focus on something that's more important. Yeah, but it's good to stick to the plan, but it not means that every interview will be the same. So you can differ one interview from another, depending on how it's going. I can, like I already mentioned, you can decrease or increase difficulty. So it matters and depends on the candidate. Okay, and the next is, would you prefer to vary is a practical task amount depends on task results? Okay, when we are speaking about practical tasks, 
it's not only about the result itself, it's, on, it's also about how the candidate describes the solution. Let's imagine that our candidate did not succeed his correct answer, but I don't know, he think about the task correctly. It was done partially. It's already a good thing. It's better than know, nothing was done. So I don't know, even process of starting the task, describing it, it also a, a thing that we are checking from a technical interview part. Any other questions? Yes. And uh, have you ever made a mistake in judgment uh, when approving someone uh, and uh, how did it happen? And vice versa, how uh, have you ever changed your mind about someone you denied? Okay, it's not more about denying or something. Like you're comparing skills with some, I don't know, golden data, like for example, what should be average for a position? What should be basic? knowledge for the position and etc and every people doing mistakes that's why at the beginning of uh, our doc, uh, topic i described that it's good to have second opinion so you have second interviewer and you can share the opinions for example if i, I don't know mistakenly put something not an appropriate way our second candidate will do it correctly so we will at the, at the end we will have some good result. Okay, and next one, how do you assess uh, soft skills? Uh, general impression or do you have the specific uh, question? Yeah, it's based on everything. Like through the whole interview, you're checking soft skills. So it's starting with story about yourself, then asking about questions part, technical, uh, it's more about like how candidate behave on the interview, how he can share information about his colleagues, questions uh, on the final stage of interview. So there is a lot of things. Yes, yeah, sometimes I'm asking specific soft skill questions, for example, about uh, mentoring in the company, about public speaking, leadership, and etc. But yeah, we are checking soft skills during the whole interview. Okay, and next is YT about uh, technical interview feedback providing to a candidate right after the interview. It depends. For example, I'm giving a short exp explanation if it's needed. For example, we know the candidate is good enough. I can say that I think you have a good experience. I will write detailed feedback and our interview or our recruiter will return back with detailed feedback written in text. I don't know, in five working days, something like that. But it's not immediately because I need to check with second interviewer. And only after that, we are giving the detailed feedback. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, do you think it is an important practice to answer questions to which the candidate didn't know to answer on the spot? Yeah, like I already mentioned that the goal is to hire a candidate. So if you know that the candidate has zero experience in some topic, you can skip it and focus on something that, I don't know, described is his uh, cover letter and resume. So you need to focus on things that he knows. For example, our candidate knows cloud technologies, but never worked with AWS, worked with Google Cloud. Why we need to ask about AWS and et cetera? You need to focus on the things that he knows. Yeah, and guys, I really want to know some examples of questions because the next question is, what is the most tricky question you ever asked? Uh, I think you need to pass it by yourself. You have a lot of position in giving and so maybe it will be luck and you will be interviewed by me. So. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, it will be a spoiler for your interview. Yeah. And the last one I think that practical task and zero part or vice versa in terms of order. Uh, yeah, usually I'm starting from uh, just main technical part, because if our candidate doesn't know even theory, I don't know, it's hard to believe that he will pass coding part. But yeah, we have some rules of how we need to conduct interview. We even have uh, some a specific uh, training for all candidate for all interviewers. So it depends on your position, but it's good to check, I don't know, 
your technical part, not at the end of the interview. Let's imagine that our candidate cannot code in Java, I don't know, even at the basic level. Why do not we need to check, I don't know, and a lot of theory even can, cannot code. So it should be something in the middle. Okay, so I think that it was the last one. If someone will have more questions to Gennady, you can ask uh, later in chat and we will ask Gennady after all the speeches. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. If you will have questions I don't know, in one week or one month, in one year, you can contact me using this email or even Telegram. So thank you for your questions and attendance on that part. That's all from my yeah. side. Thank you, Gennady. I hope that everyone photo your uh, contacts uh, so you can stop sharing your screen and I will. Um, okay, and I see one more question. Maybe we can answer it and then we'll, we'll move because we have uh, two minutes. Okay, Gennady? Yeah, sure, sure. You mentioned if candidate hasn't asked any question in the end of interview, that means he is not interested in the company, but such questions mostly related to HR interview. What you as a, as a technician can do if the candidate hasn't asked? Do you feel this note somewhere in your feedback? Yeah, it depends if, I don't know, HR interview is separate interview, it should be checked by HR. But still, if, if even of technical interview, it's good to ask some question about teams, responsibilities, how you can apply your previous knowledge in your company. So, I don't know, it's better to ask questions. Even just only reason to ask question is to impress your interviewer. You need to do that. <laughs> Yeah, really. So thank you, Gennady. All, all, um, if you have questions, you can write, but we will ask Gennady later. And now I want to invite our next speaker, Mikhailo Timoshenko, our QA engineer, with the topic introducing to playwright. So, Mike, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Perfect. So please share your screen. Sure. Okay, so uh, today I will try to introduce you into the playwright uh, so about myself uh, so i'm a qa engineer with about 15 years experience in, QA in quality assurance and last five years i'm work i'm working on automation so and last 10 months i'm working closely with playwright uh, what we will discuss today, so it will be a little bit introduction into the uh, aut uh, test automation, how different automation tools, uh, tools uh, interact with browsers, playwright project structure, how to start with playwright and basic features, and example project with uh, main features. Okay, let's start. So, uh, as you may know, yes, so the popular web browsers uh, in our days are based on different uh, engines. Yeah, let's say we have a Chromium, we have a Web WebKit, uh, we have Gecko Driver and uh, Trident and Edge HTML. Yeah, but the basically, uh, the most of uh, nowadays browsers working with Chromium. Yeah, and the main one next is uh, WebKit with Safari, right? So as you can see, the last uh, couple uh, months, yes, yeah, so past half year, yes, yeah, so we have uh, such a um, diagram that 65% uh, of uh, users in the internet using uh, Chrome browsers, 19.5 uh, Safari, and last one, yes, yeah, Edge and Firefox about 4%. Yeah, this is diagram, yes, so for ten last ten years, how uh, our web browsers uh, was developed, yeah, and uh, maintained, and so on. So you can see that uh, nowadays Chrome is the base one, as I mentioned before. Yes, yeah, so uh, Safari is the next one, and other stuff more than less than ten percent. Okay, let's uh, switch to the uh, test automation tools. So uh, how our Chromium uh, application is looking like, right? Web, web application, let's say. Yeah, so we have serv uh, service worker processes, network processes, browser processes, and render processes, right? So we have first one, 
yeah automation too it's in process of web of automation so we can uh open our browser and inside this browser we have a test automation tool like like uh, cypress yeah so out of process automation that are working through the cdp protocol with the rendering process right so this is like a chrome uh, sorry, uh, Selenium web driver, yeah. So which is using a Chrome driver or Gecko driver to uh, render to interact with the browser, yeah. So with some of the uh, processes. The main idea here that uh, Chrome driver working with web sockets through the CDP protocol, yeah. And but the some the Chrome driver uh, interacts with the Selenium web driver through the HTTP protocol. Yeah, it's not very good yeah, for the performance, but playwright is different. Yes, yeah? so it's working directly with the protocol and with every type of processes inside the uh, browser. Yes, yeah? so inside the application, sorry, uh, service workers, network processes, security location input for browser processes and render process as well. So how uh, Playwright is looking like from like a pyramid, yes? Yeah? So the uh, bottom one, it's a uh, browsers that are developed by the Playwright team. Yeah, so after that, we, they have uh, browsers automation protocols, uh, Node.js Playwright li library, test runners, and the top of, on the top of the pyramid, we have uh, different uh, libraries for the Java, .NET, and Python. So as you can understand there, uh, we have a cross-browser support here. Yeah? So we have a Gecko drive, uh, Gecko driver, uh, Gecko, sorry, uh, uh, engine uh, browser. Yes, yeah? so WebKit and Chromium. Also, it can be run on every, every operation system like Windows, Mac OS and Linux uh, with headed and headless mode, modes and also can be connected to the cloud providers like Ericube Moon, uh, Selenium Box, uh, Browser Stack, as far as I know, and etc. So speed and test isolation. So let's speak about uh, test isolation in for the playwright. Yes, so you can create a browser context and use this context for every your test. Yes, so and this context will be uh, isolated from each other, like in into mode for the for your uh, web browser. So you need you you not don't need to restart to restart a browser yes yeah, so uh, and parallel executions you have out of the box. Auto waiters yes yeah, so playwright performs a range of actionability uh, check on the elements before making actions to ensure these actions behave as ex expected. As you can see on the uh, right side yes yeah, so we have actions and some uh, state. Uh, uh, statuses of the elements here yeah, and playwright by the by default have all waiters inside the methods uh, so playwright tracing yes yeah, so they introduced a tracer and other cool features here yeah, for in tracing you can uh, after each uh, if you set up of course uh, after each test you have you, you, can, you can have a, a traceability of the test. Yes, yeah? so it means that you can uh, check your actions, uh, events that uh, was executed by your uh, application, screencast, network logs, console logs, snapshots for every uh, for every timeline, uh, and uh, they introduce a trace viewer just to view these all things. And other cool features that I wanted to highlight here is HTTP proxy. So basic authorization can be executed uh, here with uh, like good performance, let's say. Yeah. So and API uh, testing and network interceptions, locators API is very cool here. And uh, they introduced a new feature like mocking network request using a hard file, right? So let's uh, how to start with Playwright. It's very simple for for node sorry for J, uh, JavaScript and TypeScript uh, projects. So it's simple. You have to inst uh, to pre-install Node JS right npm npm in it Playwright will in, it will uh, set up you all needed uh, configs and uh, 
folders for the playwright. After that, you should uh, just download uh, player, uh, download uh, browser supported encodecs if you want to uh, record the video. After that, uh, you can execute tests. Yeah, so it also uh, provide uh, updated your package JSON with the script, and you can run headed mode with the bugs and so on. Okay, so uh, basics. Yes, yeah, so let's switch to the locator uh, selectors in the playwright. So you you can find the how how to find elements right in, in playwright. So it's the text selector. So if you have some elements with some text on the screen, just type it text with okay let's be login button right in, like, like in an example uh, css selectors select by attributes with css selectors as well yep combine you can combine css selectors with uh, text selectors with uh, this one so the class has text or text right so we can pick uh, some ends match element on the screen and do something with it Yes, so also you can use the XPath. Let's switch to the browser context. Yes, so I mentioned that we can create a couple of uh, contexts and uh, execute tests on different contexts, right? So um, how to run it? It's simply uh, we uh, should wait for the uh, Chromium, Chromium and launch it. Yes, so after that, we create a new context for the browser. And after that, we create a new page on the, this context. If you want to use for multiple contexts, yes, so we should create a two. Uh, variables constants sorry a user context here with one context and for example here admin context with another context also we can parameterize all our tests with data-driven approach yes so uh, here in example we just have a uh, array yes so in this array we just pick uh, and uh, pick each of them yeah and execute test for this element of array Selector possibilities. Interesting. Yes. So also we can we can just search elements by the React React components. Not only React, but for Vue it's also used. Yes. Yeah? So as you can see here, we have a button with capitalized B. So it's component in the playwright, and just we can find some uh, attribute or properties uh, of this element. Uh, for this, we you can use uh, uh, React Dev Tools. Yeah, for Chrome browser, just to find elements and the properties. Also, VS Code extension. I prefer to use uh, VS Code for uh, Playwright. Why they have a perfect, from my point of view, extension for it. You, you can find on the left, as you can see, uh, all your tests. You can execute these tests with different parameters, uh, with on different environments, and so on. On the bottom of the this one uh, extension, you 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 can open the browser. So if you click on the show browser, it will run you in headed mode. Yeah, pick selector, just open the browser, and you can try to uh, pick any selector on the screen. Yeah, also you can record a new uh, test record a new test from the specific place. Yeah, and close all, all browsers. Also, we can generate these new tests not from the vs code yes yeah, but from the uh, console yes yeah, so we have uh, npx uh, playwright codegen uh, command that will open you a playwright a browser and inspector yeah on the inspector you will have a code that it's created yeah for the uh, on for every your action on the in the browser uh, regarding the tracer, yes. So tracing is, is looking like this. Yeah, on the top of we have on the top of the screen we have uh, timelines with the snapshots. On the left side, actions. On the right side, we have a log of your execution. Yeah, and a source uh, source code, console, and uh, network tabs. Okay, so uh, this is the URL for the project. Uh, that I want to show you. Yes, yeah, so in this project, we will have a look on the uh, Playwright API, page object model implementation, different types of reporters, API interceptions, uh, screenshots, video recordings, trace viewer, and test generator. Okay, so let's, I will switch to the code. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, uh, how our tests in this project, yes, yeah, so looking like. So uh, let's open some scenario. Uh, as you can see here, it's uh, our test suite that's described with, uh, they will run in parallel. We have uh, here the test, uh, the name of the suite. 
Yes, so, and this is a test. So as you can see, uh, all of these methods already, uh, they are implemented in the steps. Yes, so, and we have here the ex expect with, uh, so by the way, uh, expect we, ha we have soft assertions from the box, out of the box for the playwright as well. So it's a bit uh, easier to have it. Let's switch back uh, to the, okay. So in the steps here, yeah, you can see that we have execute, we have run some comments that uh, we click something, we feel something and so on. Also, we have a page object model. Yes, so we have some pages. Pages, that's main page, okay. So uh, this is the main page class. Yes, so we have in constructor and just uh, have this page from the playwright, right? And all of our buttons here, buttons, uh, elements, and so on, we just create a located for them here. And you can see that. Uh, it's basically very interesting that uh, Playwright supports some data attributes like a data test, test ID, data test ID, and so on. And you can uh, just provide here such a, a data attribute and it will find this element on the screen. Yes, so this is the explanation how we can create a page object model. What is interesting also in page right, in, in Playwright, it's a features. Features, it's um, how to say <laughs> it's uh, options yes yeah, that uh, can you can override some specific entities uh, in playwright like a test yes yeah, so we can prov uh, this test will be invoked in your pro in your uh, test case or test suite yeah and from this test for example here i just uh, rewrite the page yes yeah, so basically uh, when you open the start with playwright you have like just uh, create a uh, go to base base url yeah and this base url will open you the application but in this case i just open the url and login into the application. So for each of the my tests, I will be already logged in into the application. Uh, also, you can find here that I just create a new user. Yes, so once I will want to set up something in, in, in my test, like a new user, for example, like here, I just invoke it in, inside the test and it will be executed. Also, it's the same for the pages. Yes, so all pages, I just create uh, variables of the pages inside the pictures and use it in the, as you can see, yeah, in the test, like I need only actors page and that's all from, for executing execution of this uh, specific test. Uh, what else interesting here, config file. In config file, yes, so uh, we have a configuration for all of our test playwright project. Yeah, you, we have a, a test here or text matches uh, that where we can find our scenarios for execution. Timeout, it's a maximum one test execution for, uh, this timeout is for one test execution. So here it's 30 seconds. For expect, we are waiting for five seconds. Yes, so retries, yeah, if you want to retry that failed test, it will be, it will retry it, for example, for CICD. Yes, yeah, so if you have some Jenkins job if, and we have a failed test, it will retry once. For locals, we will have nothing to retry. Workers, yes, yeah, so how many parallel sessions we want to achieve? Yes, yeah, so for Jenkins, we will have five and here we will have three. Yep, so uh, reporters. So they have a variety of reporters uh, supports. It's dot list, HTML reporter. Uh, you can also set up here a Lure uh, Playwright reporter and so on. So I will show you a bit later how they're looking like. Uh, okay, so what else? Um, for some actions, yes. Yeah, so use, it's basically uh, you override some uh, specific uh, options for every uh, every your uh, test suite. Yes, yeah, so if for use here, uh, we have a timeout for 10 seconds. We have some base URL. We have some local ge ge geolocation. So uh, 
what else interesting trace screenshots and video so tracing uh, once we will fail some test we will create uh, some tester uh, sorry some test it's for CICD if uh, for local execution it will be uh, always create a tracer screenshots and video recordings as well projects regarding the projects here in this example yes so we have uh, different web browsers uh, for the uh, projects, but you can use uh, projects for different environments. Like I was, like I created that for my one of my projects. And and yeah, one one more thing. Yes, yeah, so if you want to look uh, to start it in your project, like here in the React, yes, yeah, so you can use your web server. So once you your web server will not uh, wasn't started yet, yes. Yeah, so it will start your web server and run uh, your test in, uh, on this web server. Okay, let's uh, execute something. Yes. Yeah, so as you can see, uh, I'm started with configuration not from the playwright but from the local config. Yes. Yeah, so because local config uh, used here a different HTML report and only for one browser. So we have a five tests for three workers. As you can see, this list reporter uh, shows us in the in the uh, console because dot reporter is looking like a dot. Yeah. So and uh, we have failed some tests uh, and we have passed some tests. How it is looking like this HTML reporter? We can see all of our steps. Screenshot after that and trace. Let's open the tracer. And we can see that uh, in the left side, as I mentioned before, yeah, we have uh, some actions like create a new page, uh, click on something. Yes, yeah, so we can see that we have a point on the uh, elements that we want to click. Uh, we are filling something here, right? So, uh, and here we're waiting for response. Waiting for response means that we on the click of this button, not actors, for example, right? We are waiting uh, for uh, some specific uh, network activity. Yeah, and we get this response inside it. Yeah, and we can parse it, uh, do whatever we want with this response. And after the, after all, yes, yeah, so we just check in that uh, all of our uh, values here. I just, yep. You don't share your browser. Yeah, sorry, my fault. Let's, yeah. Uh, okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, yeah, this is how it's looking like uh, uh, our tracer, right? So, this is, this is uh, how it's looking like. You have here on the top of our timeline. Yes. Yeah, so, then we have uh, uh, snapshots. And here we have an, an actions, right? So, here we create a new page. Here we uh, have a uh, on the screen, yeah, we have a pointed uh, element that we are clicking on. Right here, we have a field where we want to fill something. So before and after, yes. Yeah, so that we fill here. And as I mentioned before, yes. Yeah, so we have uh, this page wait for response for this particular uh, endpoint. Yeah, and once we click on the some button. Yes, so we see that in the network tab, we get a response. And this response uh, uh, stored into the JSON. Yeah, and uh, in the inner text, we just have uh, all of our uh, texts uh, here, yeah, on the screen. We just uh, comparing with the uh, parsed endpoint, yeah, values. Okay, so, um, Let's switch back to the presentation, I think. So this is regarding the uh, code base, yeah? What we try to learn from this presentation, yeah? So it's a uh, playwright background, how to configure a playwright from the beginning, how to record uh, first test, uh, how to use page object model, yes? Yeah? So how to create test suites with parallel execution, how to work with reporters and trace your. And I think this is all. Questions, please.
Yes, we have some questions for you. So the first is, uh, could mobile application be tested using Playwright? Yes, sure. You can do it. Yes, so they have supported uh, iPhones, all of iPhones as far as I remember, and a couple of, not a couple, of amount, some amount of the um, Android phones as well. Okay, is this tracer uh, available after the test run or just during? It's not just during test run. It's it's uh, just uh, after the run. Yes, you you can you can check this tracer, right? So uh, once you will execute it, you it stored it after the execution. Yes, so you can open it from the everywhere. Yes, so even from it's a zip file, right? So uh, HTML reporter can just open it uh, inside the browser. Yeah, but for example, if you have a loop. Yes, yeah, so you can just download the tracer, this one a zip file, and execute command and pix playwright uh, show trace and this uh, and pass to the uh, to the your tracer. Yep. So, like this. Okay. Can you debug your test somehow? Like have a breakpoints? Yes. Yeah, sure. 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 Yeah. Uh, we can do it. We can do it from the VS Code. Yes. So for each test, so let me show you maybe uh, how it is looking like. Yes, so you can here you can see here the uh, play play button with the bug. Yes, so okay, let's let's do it. Uh, login scenario web page. Let's go here, create this one, and do this here. And you will see that uh, our browser will be open because we have a show browser. Yes, so it you can see that it's loading here, and yeah, you can debug it. So we have a stopper here. We can we have a, this one. You can even pick up some uh, selector here. For example, I don't know this one. Yes. So and in playwright, you will see this one selector. Okay. Okay. Thank you. For example, and uh, it is the heavy on memory on CI CD for all the tracing being locked. No, it's not. Uh, so Tracer takes about, for some test cases, about uh, 40 uh, kilobytes uh, maximum if you have some huge logs, yeah, uh, just to store it. Yeah, so it can, or you can, after each step, you just create the screenshots. Yeah, it's, it, it, it can be heavy. But if you uh, have like basic things, yeah, so it's not very heavy. Okay, can we use this tool to execute CLI command on a server? CLI, what, what, do, what do you mean CLI, CLI please? Who? Uh, command G line interface. Uh, no, right now, no. Okay, uh, did you try it, uh, Cypress? If yes, uh, by your opinion, what could be better for typical project, playwright or Cypress? So from my point, yeah, I, I have experience with Cypress, uh, but from my point of view, playwright more, uh, uh, how to say, it's more proficient. Yes, so you have, you, you can do a lot of things with playwright and it uh, have, uh, so basically uh, Cypress is a, uh, in, in browser in in browser web tool yes so uh, everything is working with browser so what browser can do yep uh, cypress can do it's a benefit from my point of view but uh, here in this playwright uh, it's basically you can do everything with the cdb protocol if if you if you if you if you want and here for playwright it's they have uh, how to say much proficient uh, features uh, than in cypress and one more basically a huge thing yeah for playwright they have a parallelization from the uh, out of the box yeah cypress can do this can uh, cypress doesn't work with the tabs yeah so it's a problem but uh, playwright can do this okay and i see the comments that uh, someone asked about play, uh, playwright via selenium uh, but i think that we have a talk about uh, this theme <laughs> and i can share just a link or you can um, I yeah, can briefly, briefly uh, ask, answer the questions. Yeah, from my point of view, Playwright is better than Selenium because you don't need to uh, create a huge, huge amount of waiters. Yes, explicit, implicit, and so on. It's here, it's out of the box. Yeah, and you can just uh, 
tune your waiter inside the each uh, each action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. And I will share while the next speaker um, the recording of this speech about Selenium. Mm -hmm. uh, what framework did you use before Playwright, and why did you decide to switch to Playwright? Uh, so, in our project, yeah, we firstly use uh, Protractor. Yes. Yeah? So, and Protractor was like it, it's dead. Yes. Yeah? So, uh, and that's why uh, our customer decided to switch to some another uh, automation tool and they so we decided with them yeah, just to switch to playwright uh, because of parallelization because of some things and so on because of their uh, cloud uh, selenium box yeah the cloud platform uh, just supports uh, uh, playwright yeah and they decided to switch to playwright Okay, and we have four questions from Lucy. Uh, okay. Do you have a CI with your play, playwright test? If yes, where? Uh, this one example project, yes. So on, on GitHub actions, you can see as far as uh, no, no, I, I don't have it yet, yet, but I will, I will do. <laughs> okay, and do you experience uh, flagging with playwright? Excuse me. Uh, do you experience flakiness mm -hmm. with playwright? Yes, so uh, so it's basically based on your application. If you are if you have uh, let's say good locators, good uh, selectors uh, described, yes, so it's perfect. Yeah, but if you don't have them, just uh, your developers forgot to add IDs or add something, it can it it can happen. Okay, and does a playwright handle multiple tabs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Playwright multiple tabs uh, they handle. Yeah, for sure. So any new new context that you created, it's a new tab, basically. Okay, and in your opinion, should somebody migrate from web driver web driverio to playwright? So basically, uh, I don't know how to answer this question because web driver IO is also supported. Uh, they have a good um, community, let's say. Yeah, but from my point of view, playwright is more uh, uh, it's more interesting. Yeah, so it's new, it's fresh. It is they have a, a fast growing uh, community, uh, and it can do uh, much more than web driver IO. Okay, and uh, does it support uh, multiple domain navigation in a single test? Yeah, yeah, why not? So uh, uh, in single test, you can create a couple of uh, contexts. Yeah, so a couple of browsers and just uh, switch between them. Yep, yeah, why not? Okay, thank you. Uh, in the chat, it was the last question. Maybe someone want to ask uh, while um, using microphone or in chat. I see some comments about Travers. <laughs> Good comments. <laughs> okay, uh, so I think that we don't have questions for now. Maybe we will have in the end and we will ask you, Mike. Thank you very much you for much. your talk. It was very informative, I think. And uh, yes, the next speaker is Alexei and he is uh, ready, but I think that we can make a short break, maybe um, like a five minutes. And I think that we can start preparing. Uh, I am almost here, yeah. Okay, I will announce you now and you can share your screen while eating. Mm -hmm. So yes, and here is our third speaker. Alexey Vasiliev, staff automation QA engineer in our company. We talk about leads, special, uh, specialization leads in our company. So let's start. Okay. Uh, so I believe everybody hear me well. Is it? Yes. Yes. Nice. Nice. Uh, so my topic is not the technical the previous one uh, so i would like to share with you my experience uh, with uh, building engineering management organization at grid dynamics so that is why it's marked as a based on the true story so i actually participated in this process so and i hope that this will be interesting for you so what is our agenda for today 
So like usual, uh, I will try to open the topic. So discuss a bit what we are talking about. Uh, I will open uh, question, uh, who is specialization lead? Uh, say a lot about me. Uh, so what for we need uh, engineering management organization? Uh, what tasks uh, are completed by the people who can be called specialization leads? What tools we are using for that? Uh, what activities are expected from our senior and not only engineers uh, in grid dynamics? Uh, what is the communication strategy between all these groups? And for sure, I will uh, show you what was reached during the, this uh, four years journey for us. So, uh, what are the main goal yeah, of engineering manager uh, specialization? Uh, by my opinion, we could help to improve people happiness and uh, for sure, if people are more happy and likes what they are doing, uh, they will do it better. And because of that, business uh, KPIs will increase. Uh, who is specialization lead? Let's let's try to define it. Uh, so from uh, our opinion, it's experienced engineer uh, who is experienced not from technical perspective uh, only and not in one specialization. So it's a active, active uh, engineer who can uh, drive uh, any activities and motivate people to do uh, something else besides uh, daily routine and daily project activities. Uh, that is why this person, uh, which has access to a lot of tools, uh, could be responsible for professional growing of uh, the engineers that are in his unit and make technical assessments of people, promote them, uh, motivate them, and uh, for sure improve the discipline to apply new policies and new rules uh, for company successful going. So uh, why I am eligible to talk about that? So yeah, my name is Alexey Vasilyev, and so I'm staff engineer at Grid Dynamics. And, but yeah, it's maybe not enough. So several more facts that could prove that I can do that. So first of all, I worked in my professional career in the different professions, let's say so, as a teacher, as a senior key engineer, as a team leader, project leader, specialization leads, and uh, even uh, senior specialization lead for several locations. Uh, so I worked, managed to work in several countries and worked for different type of uh, IT businesses as well. Uh, it's about a product company, hardware, data center, e-commerce, and so on. And I worked with a lot of different uh, nationalities and cultures and in different languages. So I believe I have at least small experience uh, in uh, engineering management that I can share with you. So let's move on. Uh, so why do we need this leadership organization? Uh, several points. So main one already uh, followed up that we try to make engineers happy and so production adaptive. Uh, get new experience in specialization. So due to our activities, we can uh, give the people a way to grow in different directions. Uh, for sure, if uh, we engage somebody uh, to become a specialization lead, it could be considered like kindly manager. So person could obtain experience working as a lead and people manager. Uh, for sure, company acknowledge this and uh, you become visible not only in the, in, in the scope of your project, but in the scope of the whole organization because you will work with the different engineers around you 
who are working in different groups, projects. And uh, based on that, uh, you will get different type of knowledge and different type of experience from them. And you can share and communicate it between us. Uh, yeah, you can make an influence on entire discipline uh, because you have a concentration, you are concentrating on information in your mind, uh, get it from several sources, and then you can use it in the different purposes to make a win-win situation for the company and engineer. Uh, and for sure, uh, if the company sees that engineer is doing something, not just his job on the project, but is ready to contribute to company's policies, uh, company's growth, and so on, company become more loyal to such an engineer, and for sure, this company become more loyal to the people who make it happen. Uh, so it was about engineering manager organ management organization at all. So, but why do we need specialization leads? So the people who will do this job. Uh, first of all, it's uh, all about communication. So specialization leads needs to talk to people and participate in the job life as much as possible. Don't bother them for sure, but trying to help him as much as we can. Uh, we can make these people, uh, they're active, they're drivers, so they can make the discipline better. Yeah, by driving initiatives and not only. You can drive just testing activities and improve the current technologies by somehow. Uh, making communication and collaboration among the people, we are able to improve hard and soft skills of our engineers. And when you see that you do your help, somebody is growing professionally, not only it's make you even more happy because of this achievement. Uh, yeah, specialization leads helps much to people uh, to grow and obtain new grades and for sure uh, become more and more professional in their areas. And uh, if the discipline, so since we are all working in IT industry and it's changed very fast, uh, we need to continuously improve our approaches in the discipline. So investigate new tools, create new frameworks, develop new approaches uh, and so on. So you will be, you will have a chance. So this specialization leads people or you, if you would like to uh, come to us, you will be on the top of discipline uh, inside our company. So uh, how this engineering management organization uh, looks like uh, in green. So yeah, we have CEO, VP of engineering and EM director for the overall organization and below, Ah, sorry. First of all, uh, besides this, uh, since it's about communication, uh, engineering management director is working closely with other teams. And one of the most important team is staffing. So uh, I will stand by this topic a bit late in details. But if the person is working on the project, uh, which he is likes, he will be much with high probability much more happy uh, than if he working on the project he dislikes by some reasons. Or for example, he's working on the project for too long. And we need to replace him and place him to the project where which would be better for him. So that is why uh, EM organization is working closely with staffing team. And in order to improve uh, people's skills, uh, we need to teach them. Uh, that is why in our company, uh, we built GridU, uh, Grid University. It's a, we, if in parallel, it's our internal 
Udemy, but a bit better because on uh, if you are enrolled to any course, uh, prof professor uh, course professor will be assigned to you. It's the person who will uh, review your code, uh, answer your questions, and help you to pass this course in most effective way. And uh, by the end of this course, he will assess you and uh, approve your skills and the special tool that I will describe later. So, and uh, below we have uh, trees uh, split by disciplines. For example, here it's UI discipline, QA and DevOps. For sure we have a lot more in our company, but it's just for example, all other branches looks the same. Uh, each of branch has his own engineering manager. I would say most experienced QA and people manager in the discipline. Uh, then we have senior specialization lead who is responsible for one location or for several locations uh, in uh, his discipline. And uh, below we have specialization leads. It's a people who work uh, directly with engineers. So what is expected from people who are called a sale? So what are these actions and what is responsibilities of them? Uh, first of all, it's about communication. Uh, so maybe it's a good time to highlight that in our company, Grid Dynamics, uh, each of engineer uh, has not the one manager, but two of them. The first one is, let's say, usual one. It's a delivery manager, the person who is responsible for delivering on the project uh, where engineer is working on. And the second one is actually engineering manager, SL, who is responsible for his professional growth. That is why I continuously repeating about communication and people management here. So uh, it's all about communication. And there are several key points uh, that are important uh, in this dialogue between specialization lead and particular engineer. Uh, it could be done on scheduled uh, regular basis, but it also could be done on uh, in on-demand manner when uh, engineer who just ping his SL or vice versa if there are topics to discuss at the moment. Uh, we have a goal system in the company which allows people to grow. So you have a PR review period, usually it's a half a year. And uh, there are goals set up for each engineer for this review period. And SL is one of the key persons who can help engineer to do it properly with all the steps and criteria and so on. I will provide a bit more details later. Uh, we need to develop personal approach to each of engineers we are working with because we are all people and we are all different. So each person prefer to do um, different job, different tasks. And it would be nice to specify what tasks we could ask to make this engineer. And uh, for sure, the last point, I already highlighted it, it's communication with the staffing team. Uh, if we feel that we need to work uh, out the situation around an engineer, replace him or whatever, we will go to the staffing team and help them. Uh, since we are a service company, so we have a people who are not assigned to the project temporarily. So we call such a people bench engineers. So they're sitting on bench and waiting for a project. This means that they have time to do something else. And just to don't waste this time, uh, when we communicate to bench engineers, uh, we can suggest them to participate full time in different initiatives which could be useful for their professional growing and for the company improvements. Uh, their tasks are listed here, so we can contribute to courses, we can uh, create some R&D projects which could be then 
rebuilt to something useful for our future customers and current customers as well. Uh, we can help staffing uh, if you have open positions for uh, other disciplines, uh, not disciplines, actually directions or languages inside automation key, for example, person could be stuck there and learn during the work and so on. We could also engage person to help to their colleagues that are working on other projects. Uh, so side activities which allows people to grow, it's uh, uh, video courses, uh, participation in different types of certification, internship, interviewing, different types of it, technical talks, and so on. So we are expecting from people uh, to do something about from this list uh, in order to grow to the next phase. And uh, all these activities is driven by SSL. Uh, as a cell, you will communicate to not only to engineers, but between different units uh, inside the discipline and not only. So usually we are sharing uh, all the news and information uh, between SLs, SSLs and on different levels, which help us to share this information and use it in the proper manner uh, to help different engineers to grow here and there. Uh, so here it is a uh, schema uh, of uh, all the people around that we are communicating quiz on a regular basis. So it's a horizontal and uh, vertical communication. We are working closely with direct manager of the person, with uh, sales in our unit, with HRs for sure. I will explain later why we exchange all the information and try to make life of people better. Uh, so main point uh, that allows people to grow is to set up goals. And here is a system that we are using for that. So it's a could be various types of goals, project and engineering. You can use goals template. And uh, the main point here is that all the goals uh, should have clear acceptance criteria, and they should be doable in a proper time frame. So if the person is ready and able to create such a goals himself and commit and complete these goals in the time being, this makes much sense and shows the person maturity and seniority. And it's a main basis of promotion people. Another one, my, uh, like main, not main, but another one really important point of our job is to monitor and mitigate different types of attrition cases. Uh, they could be project ones uh, or processes ones. Uh, and uh, we have worked out different approaches and policies, how we can act in case of that attrition risk reason or another one uh, or whatever. So if the project is too long, we can replace person. If the process works, if the process changed or whatever, we can also suggest another point of rotation inside the team. Uh, we can suggest person to uh, learn something else, to change his mind and whatever. So there are a lot of techniques that we are using and we continuously improve our skills there. So any, any type of attrition cases could be covered by SL. So uh, it's about, so it was about communication with engineers, but as I already mentioned, to replace engineers properly, we should work closely to the staffing team. Staffing team is a global and uh, staffing coordinator sees the pictures, not only in one location or in one unit, but uh, they see global picture, but due to this globability, they cannot know in person each of engineer that is looking for a new project. And uh, also 
positions couldn't be very well described. So that is why DMs and the cell and staffing working together to properly place an engineer. So here I mentioned that you can, you should talk to engineer, you should talk to DMs, to SLs, and together we will find interesting technologies and interesting projects for an engineer and vice versa, a delivery manager who is representing the company interest here will find a good fit engineers for his demand or her demand. Uh, so how specialization leads career looks like by our experience. So we are enrolling people from time to time to this role, depends on their wish uh, and professional growth path. Uh, we are making an assignment, uh, we are providing trainings for such such people. They are well organized uh, in the form of a workshop. Uh, we are doing um, assessment from time to time. We are caring uh, what the person doing uh, during this month and it's a time frame. And usually in a year, people could go to the next role like SSL or switch to the delivery or to architect. Uh, so may, being a cell uh, could help people much to develop themselves. Uh, what tools we are using uh, to do all the stuff mentioned above? So there is a list of tools that we are using. Uh, let me stop by the most important one. Uh, so first of all, we have engineering portal and uh, it's not only, we have a lot of wiki page where all the policies are specified. And uh, here on this portal, you can find a lot of interesting information and also be enrolled to the special courses and workshop that could allow you to improve your skills as a lead. Never mind if you would like to be a team leader, delivery manager, specialization lead or whatever. And workshops means that it's not be, it will not be not just theoretical courses we are viewing, but after that, you will be invited to the practical part where a lot of people who are enrolled in these schools will obtain practical cases, will do that, do them on in online mode and then discuss between each other to understand how it should be solved according to the topic of the current workshop. So it's really interesting and useful. Uh, we have a huge internship in our company. A lot of our engineers are growing with us from very beginning. Uh, they joined our internship program and then pass it. And now we have a lot of people who are senior and they are growing fast. So to make it happen, we worked out internship approaches, uh, a lot of materials, courses, uh, technical interview, a technical interview for interns, candidates for interns as well, assessment, uh, practice, and so on and so forth. So it's a topic of uh, separate presentation, how it works in our company, but there is a huge portal which described all of this. We have GridU, as I already mentioned. So every engineer, uh, is eligible to contribute here, to become a professor, to improve the course, and for sure to be enrolled as a student. We have in grid, it's uh, let's say who is who system, where you can find all the information about organizational, who is this person inside our company, with whom this person managed to work previously, and also the great point of the system, it's a feedback. So uh, you can leave the feedback for each of engineers you're working with, explain it why you rank this engineer. It's just really help people to grow because we make our estimations about the goals that we set previously based on feedbacks, first of all. And skill tree, it's a link to projects and a link to grid you tool where uh, you can find uh, skills uh, grouped by profiles, technical, soft, different types of specialization in different levels that are called grades. We have six or seven technical grades in the company. And uh, you can 
uh, declares that you have this set of this set of skills, and then uh, people who are working with you, and uh, they had a chance to objectively estimate that uh, and approve that you are actually that you actually have these skills. They could go and mark the checkbox that this person definitely can be Java developer and whatever. So it's a objective system. It also helps people to grow and grow fast. Uh, and uh, the last important tool that also was developed by Genetic Management Organization, that's tool, it's a Jared Slack bot, Slack we are using for internal communication, uh, like a messenger, and the Slack bot helps us uh, to find technical interiors. So people could submit time slots there and their capabilities. And uh, from other side, uh, recruitment could find a proper persons to conduct a technical interview to a specified discipline. So, and it's fully automated at the moment. And it works great and helps us much. Uh, here, uh, I would like to uh, stand point uh, the time frame, communication time frame. So how often uh, a cell is expected to communicate and with whom. So you can see that we have here uh, almost uh, for all part of our job and types of our job, we have Slack channels where people are grouped by uh, location, specialization, and uh, all other types. Uh, we have uh, recurrent meetings uh, set up with SSLs, SSLs, DMs, and so on. So you can find that it's a good practice to communicate with all, all the people around you on a recurrent basis. So uh, how our history looks like in digits. So back in uh, 2018, uh, we, our company had a headcount, approximate headcount of key engineers around 100. And uh, something like engineering management organization was not yet required, but we already had a lot of locations and one person uh, who seems to be engineering manager. So it was not yet officially stated, but this person already had such a responsibilities. Uh, in uh, 2019, we actually started engineering management organization officially. And starting this year, we had 10 SLs and uh, uh, one SSL and one engineering manager stated stay still. And you can see that uh, for the last four years, we are growing four times. We have dozens of uh, specialization leads three uh, senior specialization leads and even 17 locations. So that's how it looks like. So our organization is growing uh, along with the company. So what is our main goals that we reached for this time period? Uh, technical interview and not technical interview processes uh, were created, implemented and aligned across all locations. And we try to do this uh, across specializations as well. So set of interviews is more or less the same across all the company. Uh, we build uh, quite a good internship process. So uh, amount of interns that we are happy to hire is growing in all locations from year to year. So it's working smoothly. It's also a goal of any organization. GridU platform is built and continuously improved. Promotion process now is clear between almost all grades and disciplines. So people, for example, automatically enrolled to GridU course where you can find uh, all the points that you should complete to obtain new grade. Uh, Based on the statistics, attrition risk has decreased significantly in K discipline. Uh, people are happy that they got a lot 
more access and much more structured and effective information. Uh, people, especially due to these pandemic times, uh, people started to work remotely and some of them uh, started to feel themselves alone. So, but due to a selectivity, it's not that bad. So they feel that companies caring about them and they're much more happy. And yeah, we conducted and organized a lot of conferences and events by our company. It's also done by this like participation and help from engineering management organization. So, uh, and to take a long story short, so people are happy to work and read. So questions? Thank you, Alexei. So yes, and we have first question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it could be more than 1 a.m. at the same time? Uh, yeah, uh, for the discipline, uh, usually it's not that. So if we have too many people in one discipline, we are usually splitting it in uh, several directions. For example, we can split development to custom development and mobile development. And the same could be done in QA. Uh, maybe in some period of time, we'll distinguish manual QA discipline in a separate one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like uh, this EM organization makes sense only for large companies. At what headcount do you think does it worth to start this activity? Oh, as I uh, demonstrated on one of my digits slide here, it's around 100 people. Okay. Any other questions? You can use chat or microphone. Let's wait. Maybe someone needs to type it. Okay, it seems that we don't have more, more questions. If you will have yeah. them, you can ask uh, after under the recording on YouTube and we will transfer to Alexei too. Okay, thank you, thank for you very up. much. See thank you, Alexei, for this talk. Thank you guys for joining.